welcome to those of you who are joining us from, from near and far. We'll, we'll start in a couple minutes. So if you need to um, get a cup of water or, or use the restroom uh, briefly, you have about two minutes. So go ahead, take your time. Beth, how are you? I'm good, thanks. How about you? Pretty good. Happy fall. Thank you. <laughs> Again, thanks to all of you who are joining us. Um, <clears throat> we're here in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's about 60 degrees. Uh, it's a pretty good, pretty good temperature. Uh, we're in Swartz Hall which is a newly renovated building here on campus. It's a beautiful building. Can't wait for uh, some of you to visit us in person once COVID restrictions have been lifted. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's really a beautiful, beautiful building. And, uh, you know, we're excited to show it off when we're able to do so. We are, we are. Okay, we'll wait about 30 more seconds. And we'll start um, yeah, we'll, just to give you a sense as to what you can expect. Um, we'll go ahead and uh, you see our faces right here. But for those of you, for, for some of you who might join us later, we'll introduce ourselves briefly. And then I'll go ahead and talk uh, in broad terms about the admissions process, uh, the timeline, what we're looking for, but also just to give you a flavor of, of HCS. And then we'll, we'll get to, to the main theme of this session, which is talking about um, aid uh, versus uh, merit versus need-based aid. Uh, and then I'll turn it over to, to Beth. Uh, and then we'll, we'll go ahead and, and again, answer some of the questions you've already submitted to us when you sign up for, for the event. We'll answer them live. And any Q and A uh, that, that come up throughout the session We'll, we'll answer them afterwards live, okay? So I think we're ready to start. Um, we'll go ahead, I'll go ahead and turn my camera off in case you, 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 you missed us because you just started, this is what we look like. Um, again, my name is Olivia Soto. Um, I am the Director of Admissions uh, here at HES. I've been in this role since June, 2020. Um, I, I happen to be a, an alum of the Master Divinity program, and I graduated in 2011 from that program. Beth? Hi, everyone. Uh, so glad you could join us today. I'm Beth Flaherty. I'm the Director of Financial Aid here at HDS, and I've been at HDS um, just over 15 years. Beth, it's a pleasure to work here with you. And okay, we'll, 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 we'll go ahead and, and again, give you a brief overview of HCS. So um, these three main bullet points are what we're hoping you walk away with, uh, really remembering uh, about HCS. Uh, we'll, we can tell you that HCS was founded in 1816 and it's the first divinity school in the United States. Uh, it's a non-sectarian or non-religiously affiliated school of religious and theological studies that educates students both in the academic study of religion and in preparation for leadership in religious, governmental, and a wide range of service organizations. With more than 45 faith traditions represented in the student body, including those who are not religiously affiliated, and over 500 recurring worship services, HES is also the most religiously pluralistic divinity school in the world. Applicants often wonder what career paths are available to students with a religious graduate degree. And we can say that our graduate uh, degree programs lead to infinite pathways. Um, we have alumni, uh, alumnex going into every field of industry who value ethical leadership, religious literacy, and service-oriented, mission-driven work, hard work. Uh, graduates often describe developing skills such as deep listening, ethical reasoning, bridging, divide successfully and navigating difficult conversations as part of their experience. So again, in a nutshell, that's what we are saying we are. Now, you wonder who's at HCS? Now, this, this is just a snapshot of the community at HCS. Here's the data from uh, this incoming class of students. These are the folks who just joined us uh, a month ago. 
you'll see that we have 96 MTS students. The MTS is the Master Theological uh, Studies program. That's our most popular program. <clears throat> we have 52 MDiv students. The MDiv is the Master of Divinity program. Uh, we have 12 MRPL, Master of Religion and Public Life uh, students. That's, a, that's our inaugural cohort. It just, this program just launched this past fall. You'll see that we have four special students and two THM students. And I'll, I'll speak a little bit more about what these degree programs mean and how they're different from each other in a later slide. You'll also see that uh, within the incoming class, 55% identify as female, 34% as male, and 7% identify as non-binary. The average age is 28, and the age range of students enrolled goes from 21 all the way through 68. HES students reported over 45 different religious affiliations. And honestly, the most impressive number, I think, from this whole statistic is that we have 121 colleges and universities represented just in this, in this incoming class. Uh, so we have students coming in from a wide array of institutions and academic training. And, and for fun, you'll see that we have 62 languages spoken um, among this incoming class. Now, as I alluded, uh, we have four degree programs. Um, the most popular one, as I mentioned, is the two-year Master of Theological Studies program. It, this MTS offers broad study in religion with opportunities to concentrate in one of 18 areas of focus. Students enroll to prepare for a doctoral program in religion or, or religious discipline, or honestly, just to approach another field or profession such as law, journalism, public policy, medicine, arts, education, from a perspective enriched by theological study. The three-year program, the, uh, the Master of Divinity program, the MDiv, is for 21st century spiritual leaders. Students learn the arch ministry, uh, and that's broadly conceived, including preaching, pastoral care, and community organizing, and they link theory and practice with fieldwork placements in settings around the globe. The Master of Theology program, or the THM, is for applicants who already hold an MDiv, again, the Master of Divinity. This is designed for students to explore a topic in great depth or to, uh, or to delve into a new topic that impacts your ministry, whatever that might look like. The Master of Religion and Public Life, or the MRPL, again, if this is the recently, recently launched degree program, this one enables experienced professionals in diverse fields uh, to develop a deep understanding of the complex role that religion plays in, in their work, in their field. Through coursework, a shared seminar with other professionals, and a final project that deepens understanding of religion within their field, leaders develop their religious literacy to effectively address critical challenges facing the world today. Again, this is the program that we are just starting uh, with this for the second year, so we can't wait to see what an incredible uh, set of, of students we also join us next fall. Now, we talked about the degree programs. I'd like to talk to you about the, the faculty, of course. ATS's Faculty of Divinity are among the most distinguished scholars of religion and practitioners of ministry in the world. With over 80 faculty and great guest lecturers teaching more than 200 courses every year, our faculty includes some of the world's top scholars of Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, Judaism, and many other traditions. As you can see on the slide, 54% of our faculty are tenured women, and more than one third specialize in non-Christian traditions. And in addition to the 200 plus courses offered at HES, students also have access to courses across the entire university, as well as throughout the entire Boston Theological Interreligious Consortium, the, the BTI, as is affectionately known, uh, which is a consortium of 10 theological institutions uh, of higher ed in the Boston area. It offers easy cross-registration as well as a range of other, other resources across institutions. And some of these are, again, uh, Hebrew College, Boston University, Boston College, uh, great, great partners, and again, in the study of religion and theology. For MDiv and MTS students, 50% of your coursework can also be completed outside of HES. So students can really customize their HES experience to, to create a unique path uh, 
through the, the program and get the preparation each student needs for their goals. And if none of the thousands of courses available to you fit the bill, you can also work directly with HES faculty to do an independent study. So it's pretty safe to say that no two HES students have the same transcript. So faculty, and we know that people come for the faculty, but they usually stay and are incredibly surprised by the, by the warmth of the, of, the, of the student body. Now the Office of Student Life supports over 35 student organizations every year. And it's really easy to start your own organization if there's something that doesn't exist, but you think should. Some examples of student organizations are Queer Rights, Harry Potter and the Sacred Text, the HES Garden Group, and Third Chapter, a group for students over 50 years old. These student organizations host over 60 student-led events each year. In addition to the over 500 recurring events, which include weekly worship services hosted by faith-based student organizations. I will also add there are two weekly events at HES that are mainstays. Um, these are the uh, noon service on Wednesday and community tea on Tuesday. And students have access to events and organizations, of course, throughout all of Harvard, not just HCS. So students are, are, are quite involved and usually have more fun than they, they sometimes think they might. So um, when they think about Harvard. So that's that's one of our, our, our unique strengths as well, is, uh, how, how vibrant and energetic our student uh, population is. Now, we we know that you you, you know you, you're here to talk uh, you're here to, to learn more about uh, the you know, financial aid and, and how is is it's it's uh, differentiated between merit and need based aid. Uh, but to do this, of course, you have to apply to the program. So he, here are the nuts and bolts of, uh, of of the application. Number one, we need an application form in which you're going to share some information with us uh, in terms of your uh, your aspirations, uh, a little bit of, of your background. We would like to see a statement of purpose uh, for the for all um, programs except for the uh, MRPL, which would require a project proposal. And, and, and these statements and project proposals just give us an opportunity to learn more about what you're thinking you like to do during your time here at HES, how you've uh, prepare for this opportunity, whether your, your own personal experience, but also your academic preparation, and what you're hoping to do afterward, after your time at HCS. <clears throat> your resume uh, is just an opportunity to showcase how you've been involved, uh, how you voted with your time, really, uh, what, what matters to you, and, and how have you given back to uh, the different communities you belong to? Uh, how, how have you sought leadership opportunities as well? We require unofficial academic transcripts, which are very easily uploadable through our, our online application. We just like to know exactly uh, which which uh, degree granting granting opportunities you you pursued, and if there are any language courses you you've taken on the side. Um, you know, language preparation is one of the things that a lot of our students um, are really keen on, uh, especially they're 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 thinking of international work thinking of doctoral work. So that's another opportunity to showcase your linguistic abilities. Letters of recommendation, we require three. We encourage you to have at least two of those be from academic sources. It's, it's a place that, uh, again, there's this a lot of um, um, close uh, reading of, of work and deep thinking and some, some folks who can testify to your ability to thrive in a classroom and to really bring out the best in each other and your classmates, um, those, those would be good people to, to voice uh, uh, you know, how you would fit in this community. A writing sample, for the same reason that I just alluded to, it's a place that requires a lot of reading and writing, and a lot of rereading and a lot of rewriting. So just an opportunity to showcase your, your, your writing style of what, um, what, what, what sparks your curiosity and what you decide to write about before. Um, but again, it's just an opportunity to, to see um, it, how you, you would, again, given the emphasis on writing, uh, how, how prepared you are for, to thrive in this environment. TOEFL and IELTS, this is if applicable. This is if, if you have received your undergraduate degree in an 
non-English degree, uh, and sorry, in an institution in which English is not the, the mode of instruction, we will require um, one of these tests. Um, and then uh, something that we just launched this year, we're piloting interviews. Um, this will be an opportunity to not only get to, to know you a little bit more after we've already read your application, but for you to also get to know us, to answer any questions you may have and, and, and to, to really give you a sense as to what we're, uh, what we're about. Uh, if there's anything on the website or in some of these sessions that you have not been able to, to gather from, from those interactions. Um, and those should be fun and, uh, and, and just informative. Again, so these are the main components of the application. The timeline, uh, you'll see that we launched application just under a month ago. Uh, we'll continue having it open for the next three months. Um, we'll close exactly in three months, January 6th. And then in late January, early February, that's when we would start our, our interview process. And that's also when the financial aid deadline would take place, which is something that Beth could would, would allude to later on. And then uh, just a little bit after that, mid-March, we would release decisions. So that's really sort of the, the in, in, in just what the timeline looks like. And these are some of the dates you should consider if you're, you're considering applying to us. Okay. And then we're, we're here at the, the now and the main theme of our session, which is uh, to talk more in depth in terms of what we mean by merit versus need-based aid, because we offer both. So we'll go ahead and, uh, and start talking about merit. Merit Grant Aid. So what is it? It's free, a small pool uh, of money that um, we, we distribute to um, you know, exceptional students uh, who apply to the MDiv and MTS, app, uh, to M MDiv and MTS programs. You'll see that they usually include a full tuition grant and a modest stipend, uh, typically in the nine to 11,000 range. And this is determined, again, the, the merit aid recipient uh, list is determined by the HES admissions committee. So these are, um, these are difficult decisions given the incredible strength in our applicant pool. Uh, but uh, these are our determinations made by the admissions committee. And it, it really varies year to year also, uh, um, depending on, on what the admissions committee is looking for and also the, the relative strength of the of your co-applicants as well so I, it's it's really hard to say you know is your particular format uh that the statement of purpose should follow is your particular resume that guarantees uh a merit grant aid no the answer is no uh it's it's a lot more complex than that of course academic excellence is, is part of it um but also involvement uh leadership service um, it, do the letters of recommendation um, highlight something about you as an applicant that is hard to gather from the rest of your application, but makes us extremely excited uh, to, to have you as a potential part of our community? Those are the things we're looking for. Now, you don't need to apply for this. This is automatically um, considered by the admissions committee, and it does not require a financial aid application. I will say that these are final decisions. These are not, uh, uh, unfortunately, this is not something that can be appealed. Um, it, but I will also say that the merit grant aid is, a, again, a very small pool of the money that's distributed to our, our applicants. So uh, this is what I would strongly urge you and, and ask that you apply for need-based aid um, because this is just a small component of, of our overall aid package. Now, I'll talk a little bit more about the different uh, fellowships, the different merit grant aid fellowships that we offer out there. You'll see here is uh, Dean Hampton. He's a, a Manchester United fan. Um, in case you're wondering, he's playing soccer. And these are um, in, in his honor. And this is an opportunity to uh, grant a recipient uh, a full tuition and a 9,000 living stipend. It's renewable for the length of the degree program, so either a two-year or three-year uh, length. 
And there are some requirements. They, they, they must remain in the degree program. So they, they wouldn't be able to switch from the MDiv to the MTS or the MTS to the MDiv. And they must maintain um, a sort of satisfactory academic uh, record. So again, this is the Dean's Fellowship. We also have the Ministry Fellowship. Um, this is particularly for MDiv students. This is, again, this is the Master of Divinity, the three-year program. You'll see that it's uh, slightly different. This grant includes a full tuition uh, grant and an 11,000 living stipend. Again, it's also renewable for the length of the program. Uh, they must remain in the MDiv program. They, they must, of course, uh, do well academically. But you'll see also that another requirement is that they must be uh, getting ready to participate in congregational ordained ministry. So uh, ordination status is something that that would be um, that would definitely be considered whether you'll be eligible for the ministry fellowship or not. And you'll see, you know, something that was uh, quote, quoted a uh, hundred years ago that it, it Harvard College had begun. It, it, began as a school of theology and um, the learning ministry is definitely part of our, of our heritage and part of our mission still. So that's, that's the ministry fellowship. And then finally, we have the Presidential Scholars Fund. This is, um, again, a grant um, for both MTS and MDiv students uh, that includes full tuition and 11,000 uh, living stipend. Uh, and very similarly, they must remain in the degree program uh, they must do well academically, and they they actually are part of, of a survey uh, assessment um, to, to to learn more about the these really talented applicants and uh, that receive funding from the president's office. Um, and uh, what's wonderful about it too is that it's distributed to students from all over the university. And then again, this is a picture of our president, uh, President Larry Backow. And it, it just brings top students in, in all sorts of academic fields together. So again, this, these are the main three merit grant aid fellowships. Okay. And now I'm gonna pass it off to my colleague Beth, who will again, talk about the, the main component of our grant aid um, uh, program, which is the need-based aid one. Beth. Thank you, Davies. Thanks, everyone. It's great to be with you today. Um, as Obebi said, we do have two uh, financial aid grant programs here at HDS. And so Obebi's just covered the merit-based portion of it. And I'm going to go into some detail about the need-based grant aid program. Um, so grant aid is gift aid provided by the university that does not have to be repaid. So if we offer you an institutional grant, that's money that you don't have to repay. It's not a loan. Um, the majority of our grant funding, as Odavis had mentioned, is based on financial need. Um, and we do that because, um, you know, merit-wise, the large majority of our students could qualify for a merit award because we have a self-selecting pool of admits who are highly talented um, and very capable. And so, um, you know, we could award it all based on merit, but our goal as an institution is to provide as much funding as possible through need-based funding. Um, and so that's why the majority of our funding is given out that way. Uh, one thing I would recommend to students is, uh, students often make a determination by themselves as to whether or not they think they would qualify for need-based aid. And we always say, um, apply for need-based and let us tell you if you're eligible or not eligible. Don't make the assumption yourself because sometimes people make an incorrect assumption. Um, we also say, hope for the, the merit-based, but plan for the need-based. So that means making sure that you apply, and we'll talk in a minute um, about the application process and the timeline for that. Um, when we determine financial need, it's determined based on the information that you'll provide on the application materials, and we'll send you instructions with what's required. Um, and all MDiv and MPS applicants, whether international, domestic, or undocumented, are all um, eligible to apply for the need-based grant aid. Uh, how you're going to apply is uh, depending upon whether you're uh, an international student or a domestic student will depend on what you need to fill out. But the deadline for all students to apply for need-based grant aid will be Wednesday, February 9th, 2022. 
Um, and it's really important that you meet that deadline. And that means that we need to have all the materials submitted to us by that date. Um, if you don't meet that deadline, you will not be able to be considered for grant aid, uh, which means that if in the event that you're admitted uh, and you didn't meet the deadline uh, and then want to come to us in you know, March when you find out if you've been admitted, at that point, we put people on a waiting list and many years we can't go to the wait list. And that was certainly something that happened this year. So to position yourself for the best possibility of receiving aid, it's really important that you be in touch with us. If there is a life circumstance that comes up, that you couldn't um, anticipate something that happens that makes it difficult for you to meet that deadline, then please be in touch with us. Send us an email. Um, our contact information will be at the end of the presentation. But we're reasonable people, and we do understand that things happen. Uh, so if you're in communication with us, please let us know. Um, and we do send missing information letters to students telling you what you're missing. And so if we're continuing to send you the same letters week after week saying that you're missing certain things, um, and you think you've submitted them, please check in with us to make sure um, that when you submitted the FAFSA, you put on the correct school code. Um, because if you don't put on the correct school code, we won't get the information. Um, so for students that are US citizens or eligible non-citizens, they must complete the free application for federal student aid, which is the FAFSA. Uh, and they also need to complete the HDS application for financial aid. International and undocumented students will fill out just the HDS application for financial aid. And the financial aid application instructions will be emailed to students who applied uh, for admissions after the January 6th admissions deadline. So generally a couple of days after that, we'll send out an email to all students that submitted an admissions application saying, here's how you apply for financial aid, here are the deadlines, and here's what you need to submit. Um, and we also send you login information. So the HDS application is um, an online form that you're going to fill out and we'll send you login instructions for that. And then the FAFSA, you just go on and create an account and there'll be instructions again about how to do that and what websites to go to. Um, and again, as I said, and I really can't stress this enough, all applicants should really consider uh, applying for need-based aid. That way, in the event if you are not chosen for merit aid, we can automatically consider you for need-based aid as long as you apply by the deadline. Students who apply by the deadline and demonstrate financial need will be notified of their aid decision, usually within about 24 hours after they've been admitted. So um, usually after the admissions office goes out with their decisions, within 24 hours, you'll get notifi notification from us. In the event that you were not eligible, uh, you did apply, but you were not eligible, we will send you a notification letting you know that. Um, if your application was incomplete, uh, if you didn't finish it, we'll send you an, you know, an email reminding you that it's still incomplete and we weren't able to consider you. And if you didn't apply at all, you won't get anything from us. Um, so make sure that if you have intentions to apply and for some reason you don't receive the um, information, say, by the middle of uh, January, make sure that you're in touch with us so that we can make sure that we send the information to you. On rare instances, our emails do sometimes go to spam or junk mail folders, so it's really important that you check those files, um, those folders, to make sure that a correspondence didn't go there. Um, when you're filling out your financial aid information, it's important to note that as a graduate student, you are considered independent for financial aid purposes. So when we look at your information, we're looking at your information and spouse information if you're married at the time that you're filling out the application. Um, but we don't look at parental information. Uh, a lot of times students are worried um, that we might look at parental information, even though their parents are not going to be um, contributing to their graduate education. Um, and we don't look at that information. On the flip side, um, sometimes students come to us and say, there's been a change in my family circumstance. Uh, a parent has lost a job, but we can't take that into consideration because we didn't take it into consideration to begin with. Um, so we'll just be looking at the individual student and or their spouse if applicable. Um, we look at a number of different things when we're looking at the financial aid application. We also understand that for some of you, um, you're not necessarily going to be continuing to make the same salaries that you made while you were, uh, you know, prior to be 
being enrolled in a full-time graduate program. Um, so we understand that most students' uh, financial situations are going to change pretty significantly. If there is something that you think is important for us to know that we wouldn't be able to just glean by looking at your information, we would recommend that after you submit your application for financial aid, you send us an email just telling us the things that uh, you think are important for us to know. Um, and we'll look at that email, we'll put it with your file, and if we need additional information to follow up with you, we will. Um, but certainly feel free to put information like that, um, anything that you feel like is important to know that wouldn't be on the application. Um, when we're looking at how we're distributing aid, we do look at things like previous loan debt. Um, we have a lot of students, we have some students that come in with no previous loan debt, and we have a lot of students that come in with pretty significant loan debt. Um, we do look at both undergraduate and graduate debt, but we give more emphasis to um, students coming in with undergraduate debt. Uh, and I think this is another important thing to remember is that students will qualify for need-based aid or merit aid, but not both. Um, so we don't have a program where you're going to be fully funded by grant aid uh, through either of our programs. Um, we definitely have generous aid to give out, but there is a limitation to how much we have and we want to make sure that we're giving it to as many students as possible. So there isn't going to be a situation where a student's going to get a grant that's going to cover their entire cost of attendance, meaning all of their tuition and fees and all of their living expenses. Um, but we do um, you know, try to be as generous with our aid as possible. And uh, we do try to make it possible so that the students are not uh, having to try to foot the entire bill for the cost of attendance. So one big question we get a lot is, what does it cost to attend HDS? And so this is what our current year cost of attendance is. These amounts will change for the 22-23 school year. We typically don't have those determined until usually sometime in February. So by the time you're uh, admitted, we certainly will um, provide that information to you so that you're clear of what the costs are. But this is just to give you a ballpark idea of what the costs are. Um, so our entire cost of attendance, and we're required by the Department of Education to come up with a basic cost of attendance of what we think is a good faith um, estimate of what it will cost to attend here. So there are things um, that we know for sure um, so for example, we know exactly what we'll charge for tuition for the Blue Cross Blue Shield, which is the individual health insurance plan, for the university health services fee, which is um, an, another health insurance fee on top of the individual plan that's required of all students. And that's if you get sick on campus and need to go see a doctor and also covers a lot of the mental health counseling. Um, and then your student activity fees. So those are direct billable costs. You'll get a bill for that. Um, when you enroll uh, in classes. And the rest of the expenses are variables. So this is a good faith estimate of what we think it will cost to live in this area for the nine months of the academic year. And it's important to note that HDS only enrolls officially um, from September to May. Summer is not a period of enrollment for us, so we're not able to give out student loans. We don't give grants over the summer. Um, and we're not able to take into consideration, you know, um, helping you with living expenses over the summer, you need to sort of figure that out on your own. But this gives you a basic idea of what it costs to live in the area. Um, so this is an estimate of housing, of books, of miscellaneous expenses, and of food. Um, one thing that I think students often get shocked about is uh, what housing costs in this area. So our housing budget is basically based on you sharing a roommate uh, sharing an apartment with a roommate and living in the Cambridge area, but not necessarily in Cambridge proper. A lot of our students are living in Somerville, uh, Arlington, Watertown, um, Somerville, Brighton, number of uh, areas around here. Um, some students can live in Cambridge and get a great housing deal, um, but we recommend that students often look just slightly outside of Cambridge because you can find something um, a little bit more affordable. Um, these are estimates, and so some of our students can live for much less than this estimate, and some students will choose to live for much higher than this estimate. Um, so this is sort of where you're going to have some flexibility. Um, I think students see a $61,000 price tag and they panic, but
but that doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna write a check for $61,000. Um, you also wanna keep in mind that in most of the cases, 90% of our students are getting some type of institutional grant support, either the merit or the need-based aid. So very few students are actually paying the full um, you know, $61,000 out of pocket. Uh, one thing I do wanna mention about the Blue Cross, Blue Cross Blue Shield, that's the individual health insurance plan. It's required of all students, unless you currently have your own plan or, and will continue to be covered under that plan while enrolled. So for many students who are under 26, if you can continue to be covered under your parents' plan, um, then you're able to waive that Blue Cross Blue Shield, and then we deduct that from your cost of attendance. We also have some students that have a, a plan that they already are covered under and wanna continue that. They might be under a spouse's plan, that's certainly fine. Um, you'll get information from the student health insurance office about how to waive that. Um, the university health services fee cannot be waived. That's mandatory of all students. Uh, again, we mentioned that about 90% of our students are receiving some type of institutional grant support. Um, our need-based award ranges from 75% uh, or 100% of tuition. And in high cases of need, um, some students may receive full tuition and a need-based stipend ranging from the eight to nine thousand dollar range. Other ways to help fund your degree, um, and I think this is a really great opportunity for you to take some time to think about um, how how are you planning to approach this from a financial aspect. Um, so oftentimes a student's hope is that the school will be able to cover everything with institutional grant support. And while we certainly hope that we'll be able to offer you institutional grant support, it isn't going to cover everything. So it's good to come up with a plan as to how you um, plan to fund the rest of it. So uh, HDS does participate in the direct federal unsubsidized Stafford loans. So uns unsubsidized Stafford loans means that the interest is accruing on the loan while you're in school and during your six month grace period before repayment begins. Um, and repayment begins six months after you either drop below half-time enrollment or you graduate from the program. Um, unfortunately, at the graduate level, there is no longer any subsidized Stafford loans. Um, so any loans that you take out will all be interest bearing. Um, for this academic year, many of you are already aware um, that interest rates have, um, that the interest has been stopped right now up until January 31st of 2022. Um, but we expect that uh, interest will start accruing after that. Uh, we also participate in the federal work study program and that's open to students who are US citizens and eligible non-citizens. For students that are either international students or undocumented, um, actually it wouldn't apply to undocumented unless they have DACA, but international students and domestic students who are not eligible for federal work study um, would be eligible for on-campus work. Um, you don't have as much selection of positions if you don't have work study, um, but what's wonderful about H uh, Harvard is that we're a huge university and you can work anywhere throughout the university. So it's not just um, working somewhere at HDS. So you do have a lot of opportunities. Um, and while some offices can only afford to hire students that have work study, many is including the huge amount of libraries that we have on campus are often looking for a lot of um, student help. And so those are offices that um, we have students look at that don't have work study because they can often accommodate you. Um, we also participate in the direct graduate plus loan program. Um, so uh, one thing I didn't mention about the Stafford loan program is there is a limit to how much you can borrow in that program per year. It's a maximum of 20,500. Um, not every student will be eligible for that much. It will depend on what their other um, you know, aid package is. Um, but if you are um, getting a grant and then a Stafford loan and you still have additional costs that you need to make up, um, you can apply for a Graduate PLUS loan. Graduate PLUS loans are um, credit bearing loans, so you do have to pass a credit check. It's a fairly lenient credit check, um, but um, you do still have to uh, submit a form for that, and we would do that. We talk about this, um, you know, over the summer if you were admitted into the program, um, and that has a higher uh, interest rate and also a slightly higher origination fee. Um, 
and we like to sit down with students to talk about grad plus before we um, go ahead and award them to you. We like to offer you the opportunity to sort of think through um, what does this mean if I'm borrowing it for this year plus the next, you know, one or two years of my program, what would my loan debt look like? Um, and I'm always happy to sit down with students and do things like loan repayment calculators. So we can look at what do you already have for loan debt? What um, would this additional debt look like? And what sort of payment options would be available to you um, upon repayment? Um, we feel very strongly, it's not our job to talk you in or out of borrowing, but we do wanna make sure that you have all the resources that you need to make a really good informed choice. We always recommend that students apply for private scholarships, and um, I'll show you a, in a minute a slide about that. Um, but I think what's important about private scholarships is many students wait to ask about them until after they've been admitted into a degree program. And at that point, you've pretty much missed the boat on a lot of them. So now is a perfect time to start um, casting a wide net and looking for um, scholarship opportunities. I'll tell you that we get a lot of students that ask questions about it, but we have very few students um, that actually get a lot of outside private scholarships, mostly because um, they're very interested in the school finding resources for them. And unfortunately, we're a small office and we don't have um, the ability to find those scholarships for you. Um, we'll tell you what we know about, but we understand that that's just a small smattering. Um, so it's really a good idea for you to start looking now um, and looking in every direction possible. Um, and then we'll also talk in a minute about applying for Harvard proctoring positions. And these are similar to resident assistant positions. So for private scholarships, um, if you're going into ministry, we would suggest that you look at the Fund for Theological Education's website. Uh, it's fteleaders.org. They have some of their own fellowships, but they also have something called the Fund Finder. So if you type that into the search engine, it will bring up um, a listing of outside scholarships that you can apply for. You basically put in some basic demographic information about yourself, and then um, it uh, pops up a list of scholarships that you might be eligible for. I will caution you that many of these are Christian in nature. So if you don't have um, a particular uh, denomination or you're not from a Christian-based tradition, this may not be as helpful to you, um, but certainly that's one area to look at. Uh, I recommend checking with your churches, your alma mater, your any social organizations that you or family members belong to, um, to look for scholarship opportunities. Um, I also would recommend if you have faculty that are in particular fields, and you know that they received funding when they were in their um, master's programs, talk to them about what sort of organizations they looked at and where they looked for that type of outside funding. And then we do have on our um, HDS website, we do have an outside grants and scholarship page. Um, and that gives you a basic idea of um, scholarships that we're aware of, but keep in mind, it's a very small smattering. And this is just a screenshot of what that page looks like. Um, the proctor application. So many students will ask us if there are opportunities um, to receive uh, assistance towards housing. And so one of the things that students can apply for is a proctor position. And this is very similar to being a resident assistant at a lo lot of other universities and colleges. Um, so. HDS does not have our own housing, um, but you can apply to be a proctor through Harvard College. So you would um, apply through the Harvard College Dean's Office. And uh, those applications generally come due, uh, I think they open the application sometime in December and usually they're due in late January. Um, you can definitely apply for this program prior to being accepted into a degree, de degree program. Um, but you wouldn't be offered a position, obviously, unless you get admitted. Um, I will tell you, they're very competitive. Um, they require a bachelor's degree or, or equivalent. Um, you have to enroll as a degree candidate and a Harvard graduate or professional school. Uh, and the preference is that you're going to be here for at least two or three years. It's not a requirement, um, but they're hoping to have people that they can have for a couple of years. Um, someone that can show evidence of competence, sensitivity, maturity, 
and judgment in dealing with peers, professional colleagues, and younger men and women, and a commitment to learning about the academic and extracurricular opportunities available to first year students at Harvard. Um, we have a number of students that are able to get this. And when you do receive this, it basically covers your housing. So it's really a tremendous savings and a great opportunity to see the university in a different way um, and to be sort of involved, um, not only at HDS, but at the university as a whole. Um, so we would recommend that students apply for this, but keep in mind that it is very competitive. So not every student that applies is going to get a position. But we also have students that don't apply in the first year and then apply in the second year and sometimes can get those positions. Um, and O'Davies, who's presenting with me today and is our director of admissions, was also um, a proctor uh, here when he was a graduate student. So he can provide some um, good information about that if people have questions. So just a couple of recommendations of things that I think will be helpful in preparing for any graduate school that you want to attend. Um, now is a great time to start researching your housing costs of the schools that you're planning to apply to so you know what to expect. $1,200 a month can get you a, a mansion in one city and a closet in another. Um, so it's important that you understand what the costs are um, and also have realistic expectations. Um, sometimes we have students that rent a house for a couple hundred dollars a month in one part of the country and then are surprised to find out um, that, you know, they'd have to pay at least $900 or $1,000 and live with a couple of roommates here. Um, so keep in mind and be realistic about what you think uh, the costs are going to be. Uh, if you have previous consumer debt, it's a great idea if you can to either pay it down or pay it off. Um, so that you don't have to worry about that consumer debt while you're in graduate school. Now is a great time to start reducing your expenses um, in order for you to provide yourself with a small nest egg to prepare for moving to a new city because moving, even if you do the bare basics, it can be pretty pricey. Um, so it's important to understand um, how you're gonna cover those upfront costs. I always say to students, if you live like a grad student when you're a grad student, you don't have to live like a grad student when you're 50. Um, so if you can, especially if you have been working and ha are used to a salary, um, now is a good time to kind of get yourself used to living on less so it's not um, as drastic when you get to grad school. Uh, if you have a car, decide if it's necessary to bring it to that new location. Keep in mind that parking and insurance can be higher in certain parts of the country. This would be one of those. Um, and that it may not be worth it to bring a car. If you're going to a city that has fairly reliable public transportation, um, you might find that it's a lot simpler just not to bring the car, um, but start thinking about that now. Um, and I think it's always a great idea to have a long talk with yourself about your personal resources, how you plan to fund your education, and really have a, a gut check with yourself about how you feel about taking on student debt. Because sometimes a student will say to me, um, my only resources will be what the school is going to offer me, and I don't have any personal resources, and I'm not sure if I want to borrow. Um, so we have to have a long, hard conversation with ourselves about what makes sense. Um, and what we don't want is a student that feels regretful of the debt that they went into in order to finish a degree. Um, so I would recommend if you're, you need someone to kind of toss this back and forth with, uh, I'm happy to be that person to partner with you. Um, even if you don't end up coming to HDS, that's okay. Um, I'm happy to have these conversations with you as you're in the process of applying. Um, so reach out to me if you have questions or just wanna you know, run some questions by me. Great, so I think what we're gonna move into quickly now is um, we're going to do a couple of the um, questions that were asked previous to the presentation beginning. Uh, we got a lot of really great questions um, and we do have uh, the Q&A option. So if you have questions and I see there's a couple in there now, but if you do have questions that you wanna ask, um, please go ahead and add those into the chat, but we're gonna address the one, a uh, couple of the ones that have already been asked. So the first question is, is it taken into account that upon starting graduate school, current reliable income will be reduced or disappear as mid-career applicants will need to reduce or eliminate current full-time jobs? Um, yes, we, we certainly understand that. We understand that the FAFSA is also looking at um, 
information from two years ago. They're not looking at the most current information. So we do understand um, that most students are going to have a lot less income than they did before. But as I mentioned earlier, um, if there are other things that you think is important for us to be aware of, please make sure that you send us an email after you apply for financial aid and just let us know what those things are um, so that we can be aware of that when we're evaluating your application. If you don't receive funding at the time of admission, is it possible to reapply for funding if you decide to attend anyway? So with the merit awards, if you are not offered a merit at the time of admissions, you will not be offered a merit. We don't go back and reassess in the second or third year of the program for merit awards. In the case of the need-based aid, it's if you don't apply the first year, we don't automatically um, send you information to reapply for the second and or third year. We will allow you to appeal. The issue with an appeal is it will depend largely on whether or not we have any funding. So in our need-based program, you do have to reapply for financial aid each year, but in most cases, you're going to receive the same level of funding. As long as you're making satisfactory academic progress, as long as your need continues to be fairly consistent with what it was um, in the previous year, um, and as long as you reapply by the deadline. So it's important um, to understand that we're assuming that we're gonna be giving that same level of funding to students in the second and third years and then funding a new class. So we don't necessarily always have um, additional funding to go back and offer students on appeals. Um, if we do have the funding, we'll consider it, but you would have to submit a written appeal. Um, generally, we recommend like, say if you get admitted next year without aid, we would recommend that you um, send something to us in, say, December um, of 2022 and uh, give us a detailed explanation as to why you're appealing and why um, you feel you need aid this year or why you didn't apply last year and what has changed in your circumstances. Um, and then if we can review it, uh, we will. But as I said, we can't do that all the time. So it's a chance that you're taking. So. Um, you know, I recommend applying online and then applying on time. And then also, um, you know, if there are concerns that you have about whether or not you might qualify, you can, you know, we can have a basic short conversation about what things we take into consideration. Can full-time students in the MTS and MDiv get health insurance coverage for themselves and a dependent? Um, the answer to both of those is yes. Um, health insurance is actually required for students that are attending. Um, so if you don't have your own plan, you're required to take the school plan. Um, and you can add a spouse and or a child who is a dependent, um, but the costs are a little bit greater for those. Um, I would recommend going to the student health insurance website. So if you go on the Harvard website, um, you can go to uh, just type in student health insurance and it will bring you right to their website and they'll have a listing of the rates. I did look these up this morning and if you add a spouse for the academic year, uh, so it would be the health insurance coverage actually will cover you from, I think it goes August to July. Um, but for the spouse, it would be 8306 for the year. Um, for a child, it would be 4414 for the year. And to add a second child, it would be 2220 for the year. Um, and those are again the 21 22 rates, and these will change for 22 23. Okay, thank, thank you, Beth. All right. And um, we have about six minutes. To, to look at some of the FAQs that you've um, submitted to us and um, we'll try to answer them as quickly as we can. Um, Beth, I see a couple here that I'm gonna bundle that are in terms of um, eligibility for international students. Sure. And actually I'm gonna ask uh, Alessandra and Julie uh, who are a uh, financial aid officer and admissions officer to uh, turn on their cameras and they, they can join us if they would like to and jump in uh, for any questions, okay? Okay, so Beth, I'm an international student. Am I eligible for need-based aid? 
percent, you are eligible to apply for need based aid. Um, and I would say the large majority of our international students are receiving some sort of um, either merit or need based aid. Okay. And does that mean I could be potentially selected as a merit based aid recipient? The answer is yes. Uh, just like you're, you're eligible for need based aid, you would be eligible for, for uh, merit. Yeah. Um, and I see one of the questions is, um, a student from Canada, do I have equal chances as a domestic student to qualify for need-based aid? And yes, we look at each student individually. Um, and so we'll take into consideration all the information that you provide, but we don't um, you know, have more preference for a domestic student as opposed to an international student. You can take the next one. If I have a common law partner, but I'm not legally married, would I include their financial information on the financial aid application? So if you are not married legally, then you only include your income and your assets, but you also only include yourself and the household size. So um, the household size on the FAFSA and also on the institutional application will ask for you to put in the members of your household. So you'll include yourself, any dependent children or any dependents that you provide more than 50% of their support for. So if this is um, someone that you are not married to, you won't include them in the household size, but you also won't include their income. Thank you. I see another question here in terms of, apart from library jobs, what other positions are available? Julie, uh, would you like to share? For for a work study or for any student? Oh man. Specify, uh, so we can either way. Pretty much every office here at Harvard <laughs> works on student power. So uh, admissions, for example, has uh, graduate assistance. Um, let's see, mailroom has graduate assistance. There's a graduate cafe at the, at the GSAS that has graduate assistance. I mean, it's really uh, research assistance. We have students working at the med school. A lot of students working at the ed school. They seem, they seem to run on divinity school students. Um, it's honestly, it ran, runs the gamut, you name it, from, from making coffee to, to doing research for a professor, which usually comes out of a relationship. It's, it's, I think it's a little rare to see that for a first year, um, but not impossible. Um, yeah, I, anything, you name it. <laughs> Yeah, the other thing that we should mention is um, that field education is something that most students qualify for um, to be paid for through the work study program and for international students or students that are undocumented who don't qualify for work study. Oftentimes the office of ministry studies will have some of their own funding to help um, those students um, be able to be paid for some of that. Um, so like Julie said, there's just a huge array of jobs. Um, we don't prepackage work study um, because we want to make sure that we're giving it to students that actually plan to work. But um, other than when we're in a pandemic, most of the years, students that have work study eligibility and want to work typically don't have a problem finding a position. Um, and because you can work anywhere throughout the university, there's a huge selection of positions. Um, and you can also sometimes find your own off-campus um, selection as well. So if there's a not-for-profit that you want to work with and they're able to contribute the portion um, of, uh, there's a, a employer share that they have to contribute of whatever your earnings are, as long as they can contribute that and they meet the qualifications, to be a nonprofit, um, then that's something that you can set up with the student employment office as well. I, I, I'll jump in and say, actually, there's a, a website called the student employment office that shows a lot of off, off campus jobs as well. I tutored and I babysat uh, as a student. And, and that was a great opportunity to also get off campus and, and see a different environment. And uh, so that was fun as well. Well, I see we're almost at time. So I wonder if there's any other piece of wisdom that um, any of you would like to share as people are considering, again, uh, submitting their application, but also submitting their financial aid application. I would just say on the financial aid side, this is something that Julie and I say to students all the time. Don't make assumptions. If you have a question about something, ask us the question and don't assume that you know the answer. And also don't assume that it's something that you should know. I always say to students, if you ask a question that you think is stupid, chances are it's not stupid. And if it is, we're not gonna tell you. So ask it anyway. So it's really important um, that you just be in touch with us. We understand that this is 
you know, it's an overwhelming process. You're scared about uh, how you're going to make this happen. And so we would much rather have you send us an email or we can set up a Zoom interview or we can talk on the phone, whatever's going to work for you. Um, but don't make the assumption that you know the answers. Make sure that you're in touch with us and let us know. Yes. Alessandra, anything on the admissions side you'd like to share? From an admissions perspective, um, just so you know, and this was a distinction that Olevis and Beth did make, but it's the admissions office that handles the merit-based consideration, and it's the financial aid office that handles the need-based uh, portion of financial aid. So just um, be mindful of emails that we'll be sending you, and as Beth said, check your spam folders as well, as they do end up there and um, enjoy the process. We're here to support you. We're here to answer your questions. As Beth said, please email both of our offices um, and, and we're rooting for you. We want the best outcome for you and you can rest assured that we're working really hard to review your applications and your materials to make sure we're giving you the best offers that we can. Oh, Davies, can I just briefly jump in very quick. I know we're running out of time, but there was a question that came up about um, whether or not the details of your financial aid application are considered for your degree program application. And I think that's a great question. And I just want to address it. Um, the admissions process is need blind. So no one in the admissions committee has any idea what your financial circumstances are, or if you're even applying for financial aid. Um, so it's completely separate. Um, so there judging you based on the merit of your application and we're judging your financial aid application based on your financial situation so the two are separate absolutely thank you thank you beth yes and and, and and to break it down even further need blind means that we i have no access on the emissions side to any of the financial aid information uh, legally that's that's separate so even though we're our offices are very close and we work very closely actually are the data does not flow uh, this way. So uh, it's completely blind. We're making determination, not knowing, uh, I, even if you've applied for financial aid actually. So, but we encourage you to, that's what we that, that would be my final message as well. Well, thank you, Beth. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Alessandra. Thank you participants who join us from all over. And uh, again, um, we, Thank you for joining us. We encourage you to continue attending some of these uh, opportunities to, to connect with us and learn more about the, the school. We, um, you'll see that there's a QR code here that if you were to hover over it, you'll see all, our whole list of events coming up. I will put, put a plug in for our virtual open house happening on Tuesday, November 9th. We hope to see many of you there. You'll, you'll definitely see us there if you join us. Uh, but again, thank you, be well and good luck. We look forward to reviewing your application. Have a good one. Bye. Thank you.